Um, welcome to another Coffee with Sam. So today I've got James Marsh here from Andromeda, uh, who, uh, who has a Koalan project in uh, South Australia. Welcome, James. Correct. Thank um, you. Maybe just give us a, a start with just an intro about yourself, um, you know, who you are, what you are, things like that. Yeah, certainly. Um, well, I, I started life as an industrial chemist many years ago, working for a company called English China Clays in Cornwall. Okay. Uh, Cornwall was the home of um, Kalian production, started there in 1747, and it was the world's biggest producing area for Kalian for centuries. So there was a massive industry there, all built up around the Kalian mining industry. Um, and so generations of families have worked in Kalian. So um, it was sort of natural for me to finish university and go into the uh, Kalian business. Mm -hmm. um, about 10,000 employees there working in a small area for the same company. Had a research department of 300 people, which is pretty impressive for an industrial minerals company. Um, and I worked in research for a few years and gradually moved into um, technical service and then marketing. And then we became a French company, uh, became Imris Minerals, which is, was the world's, it still is the world's biggest producer of Kelly. Um, producers out of 25 countries around the world, including Australia. Uh, worked there for 15 years uh, and then moved over to Australia to work on uh, other Kelly projects for other companies and uh, been here ever since, so that's 18 years now. Mm -hmm. um, 10 years ago, I worked as a consultant for Minotaur Exploration. Okay, yep. Uh, Minotaur Exploration is our joint venture partners for um, Putra project, the Canyon project here. So I spent one year working uh, with Minotaur on the project. So I got a good feel for it. I knew what the material was there. I knew it wasn't normal Canyon. It was a special type of Canyon called Haloisite Canyon, which is far more valuable and a, uh, a very rare material in the world. Um, but we had a sort of um, the difference of opinions and strategy at that point. And so I went to work f for an American Kelly company for seven years. So, 11, so, so seven years uh, working for this US company, which is the world's biggest producer of a certain type of Kelly, dry process Kelly. Uh, and then um, about 18 months ago, I was approached by Andromeda and um, offered this role that I'm now in as the MD for Andromeda and driving forward this project. Okay. I mean, <coughs> Carolyn's a, it's a clay, effectively. Clay, yeah. Um, I think the, I find anyway that the market sort of doesn't quite get, the old market's always trying to think of it as some super thing, but it's just clay. And hello side is a higher grade clay. If, is that, would that be correct description? It is, yeah. Halloisite is one of these um, unusual things that um, people, not many people know about halloisite because it's so rare. Um, but it, you're right, it is a clay, mm. um, but it's a very special form of clay. Um, clay is a, actually a generic term for, for dirt, basically. Mm -hmm. um, kaolin is a different form of dirt, and it's white dirt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you go to white dirt, which is kaolin. Um, kaolin occurs in flat, platy type shapes, very thin plates. Um, usually a few microns across, yep. um, but a plate shape. Um, but in certain conditions, uh, environmental conditions, which usually involves very acidic water, um, these plates will roll up into tubes. So you get water, and in, in our case, uh, when we found it, we believe the pH was about two, so very acidic water. That's passed through this um, canyon deposit for um, probably millions of years, and it rolls the tubes, so it rolls these plates up into tubes. Um, that has two major effects on the kelin. First of all, it makes it high purity because it leaches out things like iron oxide, um, titania and other impurities that are normally um, a problem for kelins. So it makes it very high purity, but it also gives it this different morphology, which is this natural nanotube morphology. Okay. These tubes are all um, roughly two to five microns long and um, about 30 nanometers in diameter. But they're perfectly hollow tubes, so it means that you can use those tubes for all sorts of interesting applications. So there's two markets at the moment, sort of distinct types of market for aloysite. One is the conventional market where it's used in ceramics, and this is uh, to make very high quality porcelain like this. Okay. So this is top of the range porcelain. This bowl cost $300 in China for that size. 
and it's very high quality, so it's translucent, very high whiteness, very high strength. And haloisite kaolin is valued very highly for that. Mm -hmm. uh, not as a, as a, as a you know, special ingredient to make, give it supreme properties. Is this so, what they call like fine bone china? Kind of? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. So bone china is one name you may have heard, and that is because bone, reindeer bone is actually used in the manufacturing process. Okay. Yep. Um, but haloisite is also used um, to give it a special yep. balance of properties. Yep. Um, so there's a very mature um, market for that. It's been used for a very long time. But the good news for us is that the biggest mines producing the haloisite kaolin for that application uh, are now either closed down by uh, government environmental teams from Chinese, the Chinese government, or they've just run out of material full stop. So there's a massive gap in the market now for this material. Okay. So a lot of companies want this, and this is the reason we have already, we've got a total of almost 1 million tons of offtake, 1 million tons per year of offtake signed mm -hmm. up. That's just for ceramics. Mm -hmm. And that's just in, essentially, uh, all in China. And the most of that is in just one city in China. Okay. So there's a massive demand for this material, but there's a huge um, uh, lack of supply. Um, that's the, that's the, so that's the uh, conventional mature market for it. Um, there's also some use in petrochemicals as a catalyst for refining uh, petrochemicals. Yep. They would love to use site. It's been, they know it and acknowledge it as the best material as a catalyst. Uh, they can't use it at the moment because it's just not available. Okay. So they, they use inferior, pro, inferior materials as a catalyst. Then on the other side, we've got this huge blue sky opportunity, which is something that we already um, pushing towards and we're doing a lot of exploration now into the pure haloisite uh, markets. So just to clarify things, the, re the resource we have at the moment in the Pucha joint venture is a blend of the plates and the tubes. Mm -hmm. So it's about 20%, on average 20% of the tubes and about 80% of the kaolin plates. And that's what the ceramics people want that. So that's perfect for them. Yep, yep. But if you get the pure tubes, then you go into a whole new different bracket of um, applications. This is all blue sky applications, and we're talking about <coughs> um, lithium ion batteries, supercapacitors, water purification, mm. carbon capture and storage, medical applications, farmers, um, and agricultural and construction. So huge areas, huge opportunities. Um, also goes into plastics, um, engineering thermoplastics and coatings. And Haloisite is the most researched clay mineral in the world by a huge amount. It's actually you're not talking about 10 times more, it's you're talking about thousands of times more research. Okay. And uh, last year alone, there were about 70 patents granted for new applications for Haloisite. There's currently about 7,000 research papers going on on Haloisite in new applications. And yet there's not one single world producer of commercial amounts of the right type of Haloisite. This is pure Haloisite you're talking about? This is pure site, yeah. Yeah, so what we have, so just to clarify what we got, so that we have this material in the ground at uh, Putra at the moment. Yep. This is the blend, 20% Haloisite, 80% Kaolinite, and also this has got 50% sand in. So this is straight out the ground. This is how it comes out. Yep. That material, we have got offtakes for that as a DSO, a direct shipping ore. We've got yep. about 400,000 tons of offtakes for that. Mm -hmm. um, but the margins are quite low on that. So we could make money on that, we could make you know, a few million dollars on that, we're not sure how much, um, but it's far more attractive to, to, first of all, take the sand out of that, and you take the sand out, you end up material this is like this. So mm. it's uh, much lower density, but it's 60% waste removed. The value goes up four times. In when the you say waste, you're talking about the sand, right? Sand and so, moisture. Mm. Yeah, there's maybe 10% moisture and 50% sand, yeah. so you've got 60%. So immediately you've got something that's worth maybe four times the amount, but it's less than half the transport cost. Mm, mm. So the plan is to do that on site to start with. Um, but then if you upgrade it to a wet refined product, so here we have the material that's been wet processed, that then upgrades it again and it goes up to probably double the, double the market price again. So this material sells in the market for anywhere up to a thousand, even $1,200 a tonne. So what's actually in that? Um, in so this is, components. This is a weight refined. So this is actually about 99, if you look at it mineralogically, it's about 99% pure, of which of that 20% is haloisite tubes and 80% is kaolinite. Right. <clears throat> a few minor impurities, but that's it. So it's very high purity, 
very nice material that goes straight into this this type of porcelain mm -hmm. um, and so our scoping study we, uh, which we released recently is was focused on mining the material uh, as DSO shipping it ourselves over to refining plants in China first stage there's plenty of capacity over there because the plants there have got nothing left to process. They had material historically and it's gone. Mm -hmm. So now they're sitting there idle, short supply, so they're very happy to toll process for us. Okay. So they can take it straight from the ore straight through to a wet refined process and we can sell that for um, anywhere up to $1,000 a tonne. In our scoping study, we, we only put $700 a tonne in, so we were very conservative. Even then, the numbers look exceptionally good. Mm. The second stage is to remo remove the sand at site. So then go to a dry, a dry process at site. It's quite an easy process. It's a conventional um, technology. It's the company I worked for in the US for the last seven years has been doing this as the world's biggest producer, a million tons a year, uh, using exactly the same method. Mm -hmm. So it's off the shelf equipment. Um, it's very simple. You, all you do is you dry it, take the moisture away, then you hit it to separate the particles, then you air classify it. So when you say sand, you're talking about quartz Quartz grains. sand, yeah. Quartz grains. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's just silica sand. Yeah. yeah. And, and when you talk about kaolinite, we're talking, for the layman here, um, you're talking standard sort of kaolinite? Is yeah, there so a particular grade that No, has? it's just aluminosilicate. So it's, it's, um, it's just uh, kaolinized granite. So it's granite rock that's yeah. been hydrothermally um, converted into uh, aluminosilicate. Yeah. So it's the same as kaolin around the whole world. Um, Australia has actually got the biggest high purity kaolin resources in the world. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, Western Australia has got the biggest high purity resource in the world, but never been commercialized. Because, why is that? Because um, the costs in Australia are just too high. Labor costs, uh, energy costs, and the log logistics costs mm. mean that it's cheaper to produce in USA and ship into WA than it is to produce in WA. Oh, okay. This is, uh, don't forget, this is, this is conventional kaolin though. This is not the hollow site. Yep, yep. This is the difference we have. So to commercialize a conventional kaolin in Australia is very, very hard because all the cost is too high. Mm. Um, it's been tried several times and failed several times. Mm. Now, over, historically, there's, there's many kaolin projects in Australia that have cr just crashed and burned because the costs are too high. Mm. So what we have here is having this alloy site, and that's why I actually joined the company. I realized it was alloy site, and it was, it was something that was different, mm -hmm. much higher value, and it was, it was worth packing my life up in Queensland, leaving my family behind. And the crocodiles. And uh, crocodiles and all those exciting things. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, moving to Adelaide, because we, potentially we, we have the potential here to be the world's biggest and possibly only producer of high purity alloy site. And once it's high purity alloy site, it sells for five thousand dollars a ton mm. huge market mm. value mm. and as i've got customers around the world asking for it already they want to buy it from usa uk mm. even south korea I had a customer in south korea wanting to buy um, five million dollars worth mm. recently for a carbon capture project where you site is used to suck in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere mm -hmm. and convert to a fuel okay so there's lots a lot of exciting things happening there and um I've got probably five or six customers in the USA who say they will buy it tomorrow in truckloads if we could supply it. Mm. So what we've got here, we've got the ability to start the business with the hybrid material, make some very nice money. You know, our, uh, our NPV on our scoping study was about 400, over $400 million. That's right, yeah. With an IIR of 174. Mm. And that was extremely conservative. We played down the sales price, we played down the recoveries. And so we, we've gone very, very conservative all the way through that. So we're now working very hard on the feasibility side of it, upgrading all those different aspects. I mean, geologically, I mean, without, if there's any sort of um, corporate secrets, but what's the difference? Why, why is holosite here and not in other? Is there a geological? Yeah, that's an interesting question because, you know, it's uh, one of those minerals that's really quite, it's quite, there's not much knowledge around on exactly why it's formed uh, and how it's formed and um, a friend of mine was actually uh, he was ch chief geologist for English China clays and 35 years ago he came out he was searching the world for Kellen for English China clays who were the world's biggest producers back then and he was sent to Australia to investigate 
kaolins to find mm -hmm. paper grade kaolins. Paper needs a platy shape, not the tube shape. Mm -hmm. But he actually was a very smart geologist and he knew what haloisite was and he found it at Putra mm -hmm. 35 years ago. Okay. So he knew it was there. Um, and um, so it's an interesting story. So I actually knew about it 30 years ago. Um, and he went on to investigate haloisite around the whole world and he's the world's leading geologist on haloisite. Okay. And um, so I'm in regular contact with him as, as one of our, uh, our sort of advisors. He's got a bag of haloisite samples in his garage from around the world. Okay. I went through the other day in Cornwall recently. Um, and and it, yeah, it's one of the strange things that it, it occurs around the world, different forms. Um, the tubes do vary a bit. You get cylindrical tubes and you get prismatic tubes. No one knows why they're different. Something to do with the crystalline spacing, but don't know why that crystalline spacing would change. Um, and also there's even some tubes we found that have been fantastically long tubes. You're talking about three, four, five hundred microns long. Yeah and you have 30 nanometers in diameter, which is very, very bizarre. So what, we, what we're doing is, um, as Andromeda, we, are, we intend to become the world's expert in all things haloisite. Yeah. So we're doing some very, very detailed studies with a number of research institutes around the world. Yeah. Um, we also employed um, a geochemist, who is a very experienced geochemist, who's going through all of our information, all the data, yeah. and putting, plugging everything you possibly can into models to work out why it forms and where it forms. So we, when we go exploring for it, we know where to look. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it's, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating subject. And there's a big gap in knowledge in the market here, but we tend to fill that gap and be become all things site. So we're doing, we're funding research into site applications and we're funding the, um, the exploration and the understanding of why and how it forms. I mean, when, when I heard about the story, um, I don't know, Mehdi, like it could be like many people, but um, you know, it's just like, oh, Carl, I know, it's a big deal. You know, it's, as you said, there's a heap of it in WA, but it's always been a logistic kind of issue. Hmm. And then, um, so you sort of, I heard about it, you guys, was, you know, at that time, I think the share price was moving and things like that, and I thought, oh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out why, you know. So then they, they talk about this holocide and things, and thought, oh, what, What's that? You know, <laughs> you know. I think I think mm. I'm, I'm I'm probably not uh, too different from most people out there. I mean, those that in the know sort of understood it, um, and it's only of late that I've understood exactly what you're playing with, and and I think what you just talked about about the fact that there's not too many, or you're probably one of the only one in Australia anyway. Well, this is interesting, isn't it? Because in recent since um, I got involved and. When I was approached by Andromeda, interesting story, they, um, they came to me and said, look, we've got this project at Putra, which we know you were involved with 10 years ago. Um, uh, it's a high purity alumina project, HPA, that a lot of people know about in Australia because there's about six companies or more on the ASX, all chasing high purity alumina from Kellin. Mm. So my first reaction was, um, they said, do you, do you want to join the project? So well, I'm not interested in joining an HPA project, but I'll join a Haloisart project. And they basically said, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> they had no idea what they had at yeah, that point. Yeah. So I said the HPA is interesting, but that's you know, a very high risk area. It's definitely interesting and it's got potential, but it's long term high risk. Yeah. You know, you've got to raise hundreds of millions of capex to build a chemical plant for a new market and a new process that's never been done before. Yeah. Um, so it's something we can pursue and something we have as an extra sort of string to our bow. But the whole site is what I'm really focused on, what I'd be focused on. And so they said, okay, we'll go away and look into that. So they went away and investigated the site and came back and said, well, yeah, that sounds interesting. Can you tell us more about it? Yeah. So then we moved forward and uh, it sort of went from that point. And then in, in recent weeks and months, there's been, uh, I've noticed a few announcements coming out in the SX by companies who've suddenly found a site. Yeah, 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 it always happens there. Because now wherever you find curling, there's a chance that you could get the old tube or two. Yeah. And, um, and then that's what people found. Well, they found a, a picture, so you have to. You can only see it by using an electron microscope, and so it means it's very hard to differentiate. You can't analyze it, or it's very hard to analyze it by any way apart from looking at it physically with an electron microscope. Yeah, yeah. And they, they've obviously found the old hole here and there, which has got a, a sample, and there's a few little tubes in it. Um, but that's a long way from having a a, a resource of high quality site. The Epilinsha seems to be one area where it's formed some for some unknown reason and formed in large amounts. And 
Camel Lake, which is a, um, one of our tenements that we are going to be exploring as soon as we can get there. Um, this is recognized as probably the best toluol site ever, ever known to man. It's got perfect tubes. They're all about one micron long, perfect little cylinders, and it's just below the surface. The samples are taken out with a shovel. Oh, yeah. And if there, if there is a resource there, then everyone in the world is going to want that material because it is super high quality. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have people chasing me every week for that material mm -hmm. from around the world because they've seen pictures that were taken from samples 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So for some reason, the Eponish has got this, had this natural geological environment that's formed the tubes. Um, so when I first joined, I got together with the chief geologist for South Australia and went through all the research in the whole area over 30, 40 years, mm. looking for areas where we might find it. So that's why recently we uh, extended our tenements to cover any areas that were thought that there were significant amounts of the high purity loy site there. Mm. So we're confident we've got all the areas we need now. Mm. Um, but there could be other loy site around and hopefully we will have the expertise and knowledge built up now to identify it. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of people now coming along, suddenly finding a loy site who actually never knew what it was. A few weeks ago, they would, would have no idea what it was, but they've, they've found it lying around the ground, funny enough. Well, <laughs> it's like everything else. I remember the, you know, if you remember the conglomerate gold rush, it's like mm. suddenly everyone's got a conglomerate, suddenly everyone's finding watermelon seeds. Mm. Um, but I think if you look, you know, really hard into it, you could find your hollow site, but then you may not have the volume, you may not have the consistent grade. Um, I think mm. that's, that's always, uh, for investors, a lot of punters, that sort of doesn't matter, you know, go with a height, but in the long run, that seems to create the, you know, you, you fall off the wheels after, after that. It is, yeah, ways. and it's the key is, how do you quantify a hollow site resource as well? Because it's so hard to um, quantify um, but we are working very closely with people who are now working at techniques to quantify it quite well. Mm. But then getting an uh, independent geologist to sign off a Haloi site deposit when he doesn't know what it is himself. Mm. And he has to rely on information that, from other people. Um, now it's been a quite lengthy process. So anyone else who's going through the same process is face the same issues that, well, it's very, very hard to analyze. And then you have to find someone who knows enough to, or confident enough to actually mm. sign it off. And doing that with a scanning electron microscope process you know, is questionable because you're looking at such tiny little areas mm, mm. and how representative is that over the whole resource? If I'm getting this right, holocyte is more of a physical attribute as opposed to a chemical attribute? Would that be well, it's high, it is high purity, so that's one thing that makes it interesting. High purity in terms of alumina? As in, as in terms of alumina, it's very high. Yeah. Um, high than your kaolinite. You mean? It's normally much higher than, or say significantly higher than normal kaolinite. Yep. Um, and one reason is the iron, iron oxide is, is, has been leached out by acid, yep. which iron oxide is, discolors the kaolin. Yep. So that's why it is also interesting for high purity alumina, because high purity alumina process uses the new process, not the conventional aluminium process, but it takes um, kaolin and then as a feed material, extracts the alumina from that, so the Al2O3, uh, and purifies that to 99.99% pure. Um, so if you've, and poisons to that process are things like iron oxide. So if that's much lower to start with, you're at much higher purity starting point, then it's much easier to make a high quality material. Mm -hmm. So we have done some work in high purity alumina and we, um, we know what we can produce. We've, we've actually been successful in getting to 99.99% pure in, in one stage of purification, which no one else can do that. That means potentially it's a much cheaper process and we can go to a much higher value product very easily mm -hmm. by using our feed. So it's something I've been involved with for a long time. I was involved with it probably 30 years ago back mm -hmm. um, in the UK when it was looked at as a process. Mm -hmm. But back then the market wasn't there for it. Now smartphones, smartwatches, LED lights mm -hmm. and lithium ion batteries is where all the high purity alumina goes. Back then those markets, none of those markets existed back then. So even though it was a process that's been around since the Second World War, it, it was never commercialized. Mm. Now that there's a big demand for high purity alumina, um, it looks like there's a potential there and a, a very, I say, rapidly growing potential for high purity alumina. Then the, the Kaolin process looks like it's viable, mm. um, but it's still um, early stage because no one's actually successfully done it commercially in of large amounts. So. Mm. so we are looking at opportunities there for that but we don't want to take our main focus away from getting this 
um, the, the halocytokine into the markets where it's it's wanted tomorrow. If we could if we could mm. produce it tomorrow, they will buy it tomorrow. Mm. You know, there's people there desperately waiting for it. Mm. We'll get those going, but then we'll also work on the hybrid aluminum background um, and also on the nanotechnologies. Mm. And nanotechnologies are interesting because they um, just we've applied for some research funding for that. We've got we've already got research funding for hydrogen storage. Um, Halocytes have been proven to be a one way to safely store hydrogen as an energy source and transport it. And that, that's one big problem that the hydrogen industry's got now. Mm. There's a lot of hype about that around Australia, especially as a new energy source. Yep. People can make it and produce it, but it's very hard to safely store it and transport it. Okay. Yeah, that's right. But uh, Holocyte could do that. So we've just got funding from, um, from government funding to research that. Um, we've also got uh, $3 million of match funding, so up to $6 million of uh, application in for progressing the carbon capture side of Holocyte and the water purification we're using the Okay. And the good news is that we've got in that um, alliance, we've got us, Minotaur, we've got the University of Newcastle um, Global Innovation Center for, for Nanotechnology. We've got a coal company who's uh, committed, uh, agreed to commit funds to it for carbon capture and a water company agreed to commit funds for water purification. Uh, so if we get that $6 million total amongst us, we will be driving that forward very quickly. Mm. And that could be a, a, a relatively quick commercialization of the holocyte nanotechnology. So that's mm. also quite exciting. I think in, in, you touched on that, that's sort of the future of what you've got there. But I, mm. I, we spoke a while back before I wrote my article. It must be a few months now. Mm. Uh, I think we both agreed that the, the simple business is probably the best business at this point in time. Like you said, they mm. won it yesterday. Yep. Um, and you've got, obviously, the, the, the resource there and the volume there to do that. Um, it, it reminds me of the silica industry, what you're talking about, where you need to have the purity and the, the four nines, they, they talk about the five nines and all this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it's very sort of physical uh, beneficiation as opposed to a, a chemical thing. That's right. There is, so there is. There are some parallels with the silica sands and the high purity, and mm -hmm. there's also. But there are also also what we're doing parallels with the lithium as well, mm -hmm. because what we're doing you know, with lithium, as it started off, it was first of all Australia was just shipping the ore out, then it was going to concentrate, then going to fully refined product. So it's a bit the same with us with our mm -hmm. with our halloisite So mm -hmm. there, there are parallels there, um, and what I think the market likes about our story, and it's taken a while before we stopped, before the story got through, because I think because the the Kellin, industry in Australia was a bit tarnished. Mm. A lot of failures around, people lost money on it. Um, it took probably about a good six months or maybe even 10 months of me going around talking to people and telling them about, showing them me samples mm -hmm. um, before the story sank in. And then after about eight, 10 months of going around, suddenly the share price took off because people actually realized what we got a very, what we got here is a very simple story, um, short time frame to operations, and some very interesting profits to be made. Um, also, we now got a, mod, a long mine life. So we base our scoping study on a 15 year mine life to start with, but just on the resource we've got now, mm. um, which is relatively small compared to what we have in total in all our tenements. Now, we, now we've done this recent, recent capital raise, we've got enough money to go exploring. Mm. So we've got three big exploration projects planned out now where we're gonna be expanding uh, our resources we're looking at three areas where we've got high purity lewisite. So we've got three targets where we know there's high purity lewisite, we just don't know how much there is. If one of those comes up, just one comes up as a decent sized resource, then we'll be the first company in the world that's got that mm. as, a, you know, as, as a resource. So that's gonna be, a, I mean, that, that'll be a complete company maker. But now the good thing is we've got the money to do that. We've got you know, for, over $5 million in the bank. Um, we've got about $8.5 million of options that would be exercised probably uh, this time next year. So that'll take us right through to the options coming through. And then we've got a very low capex as well. That's what an also attractive uh, mm. proposition to people mm. that we don't need much capex. Mm. In fact, all we need to do to start with is to open up the ground and ship material out. That's all we do. And it's a quarrying operation. It's not really a, a real mining yeah, operation. Right. Yeah. It's about 30 meters deep maximum. Um, you know, it's, it's out of the way in an in a area where jobs are, will be very desirable, creating new jobs, um, and it's very low impact. We're not talking about nasty chemicals, tailings, dams, all those sort of things that cause a problem for mining approvals. 
Mm. So the mining approval process should be um, very quick and simple. Um, it's a process you have to go through. No, you, there's no way mm. to avoid that, but it's one that the government is uh, very supportive because they could realize it's a, uh, it's a very low impact mine. So it's one that they can get across the line without, any, uh, without too many problems. So we have a regular relationship with the, uh, with the government on this, working very closely with them. Um, environmentally, we've, we've done a baseline study, 12 months came up clear. We've just finished our spring um, environmentals, that's come up all clear as well. So at this point in time, there's nothing we can see that's gonna trip us up. It's just a question of going through this process uh, and getting it done right as quickly as possible. I think the most, one of the most important things for this kind of stuff is uh, you, you're sort of like the um, sort of the, the iron ore industry. You just need to put it on the back of a truck and ship it out. And you, you logistically, you're quite close to a port, I can see. Mm. Um, so, you know, I can see the, 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 the path out, the exit point. It's, although it's still ha you still have your challenges, I guess, but at least it's not in Timbuktu, I guess. No, I mean, the, the pieces of the, piece the puzzle there, we just mm. put them together now. So yeah, we know that everything's there, like logistics is a key. You know, with the industrial minerals, logistics is um, a major cost. And with DSO, you're talking about 80% of the cost is logistics. So mm. um, we're quite lucky that um, we have a port, a new port facility at Lucky Bay that's just coming to operation now, which can do bulk materials. Mm -hmm. And they, um, we're working quite closely with them um, to do a deal where they just ship the bulk right through to deliver it to customers mm. in China who are waiting for it um, at the, where it will be refined. So yeah, that's, that was a key piece to get in, into place, the logistics, but we're happy with that. Um, the other thing we're looking at quite closely now is uh, wet processing at site is an option now. It never used to be. Um, so we focused the SCOBY study on dry process, which we know very well and we know it will work. Mm. So we've got the numbers for that. They look very attractive numbers. But there's, there's now there's new plants available now, which are super economical plants water-wise, because water's a problem in that part of the world. Mm, mm. There's no water around, but these plants now use uh, very small amounts of water. They research 90%. And we're looking, so as part of our feasibility studies now, we're looking very closely at possibly putting a wet plant in that site. Because the, it, the capex, the opex, everything looks like it could be lower cost than a dry plant, which is phenomenal. Mm. And what you, the advantage you get there is um, when you wet process that site, the recovery goes up from 37, which should be put in our scoping study, up to probably 50%. Mm. So uh, NPV everything will just leap up considerably if that, if that proves up. Plus mm. we also have the ability then, which is quite exciting, is to purify the haloid site. Mm. So the 20% of the haloid site is in that material. Potentially if you've got a wet plant there, we can then purify that up to 95% plus haloid site purity, which means we then have an, a $5,000 a ton material available at site, which means transport cost irrelevant. Mm. That can go anywhere in the world, right. make a fortune. Yeah. And looking at, looking at that deposit we have there, we have about, well, if, if you just quantify the haloid site, we've, we've actually got there and, and monetize that, there's about, probably about $10 billion worth of haloid site there in that jork resource we have already. Mm -hmm. So actually a phenomenal amount of value there if we can do that. So that work process stage is very exciting and we've got work going on in the UK, ex-colleagues of mine in the UK and USA. They both run companies that specialize in this, so mm -hmm. they're doing work for us now. So we're also driving that part forward. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a really sort of interesting few months or next 12 months to 18 months for you guys. I think one of the biggest advantages, although a lot of people don't see it, is that the fact that you come from that industry, you sort of know the, uh, that the, the end user part of the industry, what they use for, what they're looking for, um, mm. which is very important because you're not talking gold, you're not talking nickel, you're talking quite specific in terms of um, what kind of product would these guys need, yeah. what level, things like that. I think that's a lot of people sort of brushed up by, but I think, you know, I didn't realize you came from that industry. Right. Um, I thought, you know, you're a typical MD, you know, you're a geo <laughs> or something. But that makes a big impact in my, I think so. I, yeah, well, I think it, well, it's very true. And um, that's what the message, it took me so long to get the message across to the market here because the market here doesn't really understand industrial minerals, mm. but very good understanding of things like gold, 
nickel, cobalt, whatever. So mm. you get one kilo, it's worth this amount. There's a market, you sell it. Yeah. Industrial minerals, very different situation. Like I say it's, there's so many different variables there. You know, you've got the mineral energy, you've got the chemistry, you've got the particle size distribution, the impurities, mm. um, all these different things, and they all have implications on the application. Mm. A slight change in color, a slight change in pH, a slight change in moisture, or even product form affects the applications. Mm. But I've been, I've been selling stuff for 31 years, and I was, I was responsible for selling it around the whole world for the biggest company in the world. Mm. So I've probably dealt with almost every application you can, you can come across for, for Kaolin type materials. Mm. So having that knowledge has been tremendous boost forward. It also means I've got 31 years of networking experience, so I know mm all the people in the world who can process it um, and all the other aspects that come in behind it, logistics of it, the packaging, all these other aspects that are very important. That the expertise just isn't here in Australia really. Um, and it's, I think that's what's sort of accelerated us through this whole process. Mm. If we need to get something done, I know exactly who to go to to get it done straight away. I think that's, that's very important. I think the more we, you've spoken and you're you know, starting to get a better understanding of what this is about, I think it's very important to have someone like yourself where you know the, how to sort of direct traffic in terms of getting to the end product. Um, more so than the geology, it's, it's fairly simple as you say, it's quarrying, mm. it's not um, hard. If it's there, it's there and sometimes, you know, you, you sort of try, people try and figure out how it got there, but if it's there, it's there, who cares really? Yeah, because there's enough of it, you, you can quantify it, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And, um, yeah, I think that the, the problem is, over the years has been that people have always chased Kellen for the paper industry. Mm. And this, is what, this is what was happening with the Minotaur we're doing and it's happened with all the other projects in Australia where they've, it's right, all the uh, Kellen in the world, majority, 40% goes into paper. We've got to chase that market. And there's no doubt there's a big volume of business there to be had, but mm. it's the most difficult market to go for. Mm. They, want the, they want the highest purity, the highest brightness, the finest particle size and the lowest price. And you want huge, consistent amounts, mm. uh, no failures. So to supply the industry is, is um, it's really you're, you're working on very thin ice there. Mm. And for any small company, then it, it's disastrous because one, one bad delivery, one rejected load, you, know, you can send the company under. And there's mm. no, the margins there are so small now, you're talking about tens of dollars mm. a ton margin. Well, if we can purify this and get some material, um, which is in our scoping study, we're talking about margins there of five, six, seven hundred dollars a ton. Mm, mm. Huge margins. Mm. If we've got the pure site, we're talking about margins of over four thousand dollars a ton margin. Mm. For something that's just a very simple purification process. Mm. So it's all about uh, knowing what you've got and who wants it and why they want it. Mm. Oh, I know exactly why the customers want it. I know what they value. Mm. So there's no case, there's no chance of them pulling the wool over us. Uh, but also I know if I'm wasting my time going to a certain area or a mm. certain sector, I know exactly where this should go and who wants it. Mm. Uh, I know people, I've got friends around the, around the world who also are waiting for this material to sell themselves. So mm. I've got people set up in Europe, um, other parts of the US and um, in the Middle East, mm. who as soon as we have this available in commercial amounts, it's just get it to us and we'll sell it for you. Mm. I, I, I remember in almost 10 years ago, I was sitting in a hotel talking to someone about um, um, projects and thing. he asked me out of the blue, this is in Malaysia, he said, oh, have you got any clay? <laughs> and he was working for the, that French company you mentioned. Emirates. Yeah. yeah. And he right. said, yeah, yeah, we, I'll buy it yesterday. And that's exactly what you said. Mm. And that was uh, 10 plus years ago. Um, but James, I think um, that's fantastic. I mean, I've learned a lot. I can guarantee you that. Um, <laughs> that's good. In, um, but uh, thanks for your time. And uh, we'll maybe, you know, down the road sometime, we'll do another update and catch up and see where you guys, um, maybe you're already mining at that stage. Well, hopefully this time next year, we, we might be very close to mining, yeah. And uh, that'll be another quantum leap in the company's uh, life. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>